the government's decision brought down the curtain on 300 years of history. But there has to be some truth in the sentiment that 300 years of history, if it comes to a grinding halt or an abrupt stop, a guillotine stop, um, you know, that is very sad and it is sort of very terminal. Um, my own view is, of course, you then got to say, well, so what is left and where do we go from here? And actually the decision was that the Black Watch, the Argyles, the Highlanders, the Royal Hunter Fusiliers, the Royal Scots, the Kings and Scottish Borderers were no more, but the Royal Regiment of Scotland was, and it would be carrying forward the 2,500 years of history, tradition, culture, ethos, the business of being Scottish fighting infantrymen. Um, in the way that perhaps might be more appropriate for the 21st century. Um, the saddest thing of all is if all of our battalions had over time, as it were, all been withering on the vine simply through want of manpower. Where do you think you're going, laddie? Take cover! Yet the loss of the regimental structure itself contributed to a reduction in recruitment. Right, lads, we're now going for a short nature rumble. Individual regiments had recruited in their own territories. Young men had followed their fathers into the family regiment. The army called it the Golden Thread. Veterans claimed that thread had broken. There were 30 trades open to men who joined the infantry. Starting pay for three-year men, £19.53 a week. A more disturbing threat to Scottish recruitment came from the army's treatment of its own soldiers. In 2004, Fusilier Gordon Gentle from Pollock and Glasgow was killed in Iraq. An English coroner found a failure to provide suitable protective equipment and blamed army negligence. There was undoubtedly a huge dip in 2004-05. I think there was a coincidence of factors. One, you know, the tragic, the death of Fusilier Gentle and the, the effect that that had in Scotland, um, you know, because all politics are local and very much this was, you know, regional Scotland becomes national Scotland and there was a whole approach to Iraq and that particular and very sad death. Then there was the reductions and indeed what was seen as the loss of Scottish regimental identity while we actually formed a new one. Um, then there was the whole business of the, the Iraq war. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it indifferent? And at the same time, the army was giving its recruiting system the biggest shake up for 40 years since national service. So actually there were a number of contributory reasons for why actually the foot in a sense came off the pedal. It's coming back up again. 2009 has seen the first rise in Scottish army recruitment since 2003. Perhaps the result of increased unemployment and an unsteady economy. By the left. Quick. One figure though is even more revealing. It's the continued difference between Scotland and England. If Scotland is producing an infantry battalion at the moment for about every 700,000 people, and in England it's about every 1.3 million people to produce a battalion, if you're thinking about contribution to the fighting capability of um, Britain as a whole, Scotland is owed an extraordinary debt by the rest of the country. This is a troop from a cavalry regiment, the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, descendants of Ensign Ewart, the man who liberated the French regimental eagle at Waterloo. And these young men are already veterans of Iraq. <laughs> and I know folks say that we got it wrong, but, uh, you know, we called it right in Iraq. They said there was no link between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Well, uh, well, let me tell you, there is now. <laughs> there is now. Eyes, foot! Stand out! Ease! Stand easy! And what's next for you guys? Will some of you go to Afghanistan? Uh, I should go to Afghanistan yeah. soon. Yep. I don't know about soon, but it's just time in your future. How do you feel about that? Can't wait. Yep. Oh, Excited yep. to go. Oh, be good. There is that pride and tradition which is heavily relied on, but, but the other side of that is if people say, you know, these are kids, you know, the cannon fodder argument. How do you respond to that? I would refute it absolutely, I'm afraid, Rory, because um, I, I don't think there are many organisations that give their young people um, the depth and breadth and extent of training that it is designed to produce soldiers who are fit for purpose. We're pretty clear what the purpose is, and it is not to be cannon fodder. Um, it is to be thinking individuals, members of a team, and able to play their part in difficult situations. Right! Go! Times when we've stripped out the sort of vocational aspect of so many other parts of the country's um, sort of work base. I mean, 
I mean, I would hold my hand up tomorrow and say that we put young men who may choose to leave at the three or four year point, they are better people than they came in. And we have made them so. One day I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can make a bit of my life, because obviously, being the way the world is in it right now, there's not many jobs, stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's hard for a young person to get into some sort of thing, so uh -huh. I thought I'd probably challenge myself. And this being the Scotland's only cavalry regiment, I thought, give this regiment a try. And I mean, it really is good. It's, it's proud to, I mean, guys play football. They get to represent their country. Yeah. Guys play rugby. They get to represent their country. Unfortunately, I'm rubbish at both sports. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll come and represent my country in this fine regiment. By the left! Quick! Fast! And you're fighting... Who are you fighting for? Each other. Yeah. Yep. Each other, the country, the regiment, the army, and ourselves yeah. as well. Mm. It's just really one big, one big hole. One big heavy family. Yeah. So if I said, you know, you're fighting for the British Army, you are, but you're fighting for a bit of the British Army. Yeah. No, we're fighting for the whole army, but yeah. yet again, we're still fighting for mm. Scots as well, because we're the only mm. Scottish cavalry regiment yeah. at the end of the day. But fight, like, like you said, we're fighting for everybody, but there's still that bit inside you that you're still doing it for Scotland because we're the only Scotland's cavalry regiment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Looking back to the years after Culloden, I wonder if the men who came from these hills to fight under the British flag realised just what they were starting. Their impact on two and a half centuries of British history has been astounding. They built a deserved reputation for ferocious loyalty. Time and again, they surrendered only their lives. This is the Scottish National War Memorial inside Edinburgh Castle. It was opened in 1927 as a tribute to the Scots who fell in the Great War. Today, the roles of honour include every Scot who's fallen since that date, a list that continues to grow. Given the sacrifice of Scottish soldiers in the Great War, it's appropriate that this, the focal point of the Scottish National War Memorial, this casket containing the names of all those who fell in the war, should be set here at the very pinnacle of the rock on which the castle is built. The very top of the castle rock that tells you how important these names are to the people of Scotland. Soldiering has come naturally to Scotland throughout history. The Scots have been there for glorious victories and bloody defeats all over the world. And so, after 300 years of service to Britain's kings, queens and empire, what will become of the Scottish soldier in the modern world? Will their illustrious reputation, like their famous regiments, simply disappear? Frankly, I doubt it. While the names of these great regiments may have altered, the tradition of the Scottish soldier is as alive and strongly felt as ever. I think it's in the blood of the nation. The role may be changing, but the fighting Scots are here to stay. Our Scotland season continues this week here on BBC4 as Peter Capaldi paints a portrait of Scottish art at nine on Monday and then at nine on Tuesday we get a privileged inside look at the tweed industry. But stay with us next tonight for the making of Culloden.